This is what happens to, to men in combat. They, they cease being individuals. They become part of a machine that kills and that, that uh, bayonets people, that sets fire to people, that laughs at people when they're burning up, you know, from uh, getting hit by a flamethrower, and they're running down the trail screaming in agony, and you laugh at them. <laughs> and it's, it's, uh, it's because you're no longer an individual. You're part of a machine, a killing machine. Late 1944 into 45, great armies battle to the death for tiny patches in the Pacific. Peleliu, Iwo Jima, Okinawa. The closer the Allies got to Japan, the more terrible the fighting. When the bombardment started, it was just so absolutely overwhelming that you just almost felt like an ant on the surface of the earth. And we didn't see how anything could live through that. We all hid in shelters because we expected fierce bombardment from the warships. So surprisingly, few people died from the shelling. And then we went on in, and as we got closer, you couldn't even see the beach or the island. It was just this sheet of flame with a wall of smoke behind it. I was scared to death. My heart was pounding. Then you get this motion sickness, and you turn green. Everybody's vomiting and sick. And we're about a half mile from shore, and there was one coming the other way, and everybody kind of looks around, and we decided that this was not going to be the tea party that we thought. For me, it was like going through the gates of hell. You were terrorized. Your mind was boggled with, my God, what am I going to do? Uh, how am I going to respond to all of this? So finally, we rolled up on the beach, and the sound of small arms fire really did become intense. It didn't seem to us that the bombardment had destroyed anything. Then I looked back across the reef and there were burning Amtraks just all over the place and Marines were trying to wade ashore. It was such a momentous event that um, I knew I would never be the same afterward. I ran over to this fallen Marine, turned him over, and my God, it's my friend Stan Sanders. He was hit by uh, multiple machine gun bullets. He was dead. That was a tremendous shock. You know, what kind of a killing machine is this that takes these people of this age and just smashes them up? I just simply could not conceive of what kind of madness this was. The Japanese on Peleliu had dug themselves deep into caves and bunkers. Glimpses of them alive were very rare. Once the Americans set foot on the island, we knew we could never expect or hope to win the battle. So we simply resolved to destroy as many Americans as we could before facing an honorable death. There's never no thoughts about, I'm doing this for my country. That's a lot of crap. You're doing it because you're there and you can't leave your buddies. 
then they and they wouldn't leave you either. The Jap rifleman would try to hit the stretcher bearer. Then sometimes they would even shoot at the wounded man on the on the stretcher. You, you heard these plaintive calls, Carmen, Carmen, you know, help. Uh, at times, you, you just were beside yourself as to where and how and what to do first. God, we were 18, 19-year-old kids. We were doing trauma surgery, for God's sakes, out there. Treating these boys, they would cry for their mother. Mom, help me. I had an awful lot of close calls, but for sheer massive violence, the worst experience I ever had was going across that open airfield and the Japanese fired at us with every caliber of weapon they had from Bloody Nose Ridge. I could see Marines falling all around us. Snafu and I couldn't even yell at each other because of the noise, and a great big shell hit and exploded, and it just seemed like the world was rocking back and forth. I couldn't tell you how many times I recited the 23rd Psalm and the Lord's Prayer both, and I could see Snafu's lips moving, and when I got close enough to him, there was just this voluminous amount of, of uh, cussing coming out of his mouth, you know. The harder I prayed, the more he cussed. I survived because of my mother's prayers. Believe me, there were no atheists in foxholes in those days. Everybody had something to do with God. I was an atheist in a foxhole. I never went through the phase of somehow God is protecting me, or the reason that that bullet went between Milligan and me is because God's hands or an angel's hands was over us and protecting us. I just didn't believe that. Peleliu's coral was too hard to dig latrines or graves. The living shared foxholes with the dead. It was just so nauseating that you could hardly eat your sea rations. The odor of the dead and the odor of human excrement, of rotting rations. The flies were so bad, they'd get on the canteen, sometimes fall in your coffee, you'd have to flip them out and they may have just come from a corpse over to your coffee. It got to the point where some days I didn't eat anything at all. The Japanese slipped behind American lines at night, lobbing grenades, slitting throats. Two sneaked up on Eugene Sledge and his buddy Snafu, who killed one, but only wounded the other. Just wailed and, and, and made all these pitiful noises, and somebody said, throw a grenade out there and shut him up. And Frenchy Labou, who was in the machine gun platoon, said, hell no, that's music to my ears. They killed my brother at Pearl Harbor. They let him yell. I like to hear that. This, this is the kind of stuff that really is, is, uh, is tough on the nerves. You can't wait till daylight comes so you can shoot somebody, I'll tell you. And you wonder that, you know, if you have any misgivings about killing someone. My God, you can't wait to get the opportunity. The hatred was so intense that um, after a position was taken, uh, typically one or two men would just take it on themselves or the sergeant might order them to do it before an officer could come and stop us and just act as what was called the possum squad and just go around and shoot all the wounded in the head because uh, they would lie there with their eyes closed and you thought dead, and all of a sudden you saw they had a grenade they were ready to throw. So we just didn't fool with wounded at all.
Now we have our option. We could leave them there to suffer, or we can kill them. We could not carry them back. Of course, at the same time, so between men in combat, you don't really look upon that, that enemy soldier as a human being. This is an enemy. This is a rat. This is somebody that needs to be killed. For a while, one U.S. division gave two weeks' leave for every Japanese taken alive for questioning. When the offer ended, the supply of prisoners dried up. No one wanted to take prisoners, wounded or not, and the bodies of the enemy dead received little respect from either side. The Japs had cut the penis off and stuffed it in the mouth of two of the dead Marines and then cut the head off and set it on the chest. And the third one was just unrecognizable as a human being. I mean, they'd take, apparently taken sabers and chopped his legs and arms up at the joints and just piled them over the trunk of his body. And it was the biggest, bloodiest mess you ever saw, and the blood was all blackened. And from then on, I thought to myself, the more of those Japs I can kill, the better it's going to be, and I have absolutely and never will have any compassion for any of them. There was a fine dividing line between collecting souvenirs and savagery. Some Americans would hack gold teeth out of Japanese jaws with their knives. One day, a medical aide found Eugene Sledge bent over a Japanese corpse. Doc Caswell happened to be walking near me. He said, Sledge, what are you going to do? I said, Doc, I'm a, I think I'll get me some gold teeth, start my gold teeth collection like a lot of the guys. And he came over to me and said, Sledge, don't do that. You know, you don't want to fool with those things. And I said, well, a lot of the guys do it. And he said, yeah, but, you know, just think, what, what, think of the germs. And I... I didn't know anything about germs then, so I, I hesitated. And he said, and, and, and think about what your parents would think. And I said, well, my dad is a doctor. I think he'd be fascinated, but my mother would be horrified. And he said, well, Sledgehound, I just don't think you ought to do that. And I think if you did it, you'd regret it later on. And I said, well, Doc, I guess you're right. So I never took any gold teeth. and. In retrospect, I think Doc was just trying to help me retain some veneer of civilization and um, decency. Rather, I, not that I imply my buddies were indecent when they took gold teeth, but some of them today kind of cringe at the thought of what they did. I wince a little uh, because um, I, I kept a skull. Um, Somehow it didn't seem to be a desecration, and uh, I put it uh, on a, uh, a desk I had built inside of a tent, and it sat there for many days. As a matter of fact, it became a candle holder. By that time, we had seen so many ghoulish things. We had seen bad, badly wounded people, mutilated people, that Having a skull did not seem as outlandish in that context as it would have in other contexts. It was almost an emblem of who we were, because so many of us were committed to death. We came here to die. We came here to die. The final assault on the ridges of Peleliu. The devil himself would have created a place to defend, this would have been it. It's no wonder that so many people have uh, nervous breakdowns. We had uh, good numbers of what we called combat fatigue. 
unable to function any, normally anymore. Although they were not wounded as such, but their wounds were here. Your spirit just gives and you just crack. We saw this guy coming in at us. On low, he's just about on water level trying to escape the guns, you know. And luckily for us, he had a 500-pound bomb, which we knocked off of him out in the water. If that had landed in the back of my ship, I'd have been a dead duck. From October 1944, the Japanese deployed a new weapon, the kamikaze. Suicide attacks sank over 30 Allied ships and damaged 300. They were crazy, absolutely crazy. They had to be. American people, white people, uh, Caucasian people, don't have the same feeling about going to heaven and paying a penalty like that. They had to be brainwashed. According to Japanese propaganda, there were solemn rituals before takeoff. The divine purity of their sacrifice would inspire and save the nation. Even the emperor sent his thanks. Crowds turned out to wave them away. The truth was very different. They were virtually press ganged and barely trained. Many went through mental hell. A few even crashed quickly to end the agony. Occasionally the Americans recovered a body. Then some began to see them as fellow human beings. They brought him aboard his body and they put him in the officer's mess. You know, had the big table, they put him on there and they went through his pockets and there were the same things that you and I had in my pockets. There was the photo of the family, there was a religious something, there was some money, you know. And that to me brought everything closer than anything. Kanji Suzuki is a kamikaze who survived. He was neither a god nor crazy. He was a rather scared 17-year-old. When I left home, with much backslapping and ceremony, I felt like a hero and behaved like one. But once it had all sunk in, I got the jitters, and I'd feel anxious and scared all day long. He coped by visiting local brothels, where one yen bought as much time with a girl as it took a stick of incense to burn down. If the girl liked you, and they liked Kanji, she would lick the incense to make it burn slower. Only by being with women could I forget my fear and anxiety. His runway is now a field of sweet potatoes. His three-man bomber took off alone. No other crews showed up. There were no last rites, no thanks from the emperor, no one to wave, good wave goodbye. It's strange how when facing death, you remember things from your childhood. Things come back to you that you never remembered before. 
For example, I remember the face of the music teacher at my school playing the organ. And my mother walking in front of a line of people carrying the ashes of the dead. Also, I remembered all the girls I'd ever known in Otsu, Shanghai, and at the base. My plan was to fly just above water level to avoid getting hit. But when Tanaka in the rear shouted, the machine gun is jammed, I felt a shiver down my spine. I thought, this is the end. Kanji Suzuki was hit and passed out. He was picked up by the Americans and has felt guilty ever since. I can't escape responsibility for the death of my two crew members. I kept thinking about them when I was a prisoner in America. Far from feeling sorry for them, I felt bad living on when they had died. Japan's ground troops also stared death in the face. Tokyo sent plenty of orders to fight on, but no supplies. I would say it was like hell on earth. You had to ask yourself if the Japanese army had actually come to Burma to fight the enemy or to torment our own troops. It got that bad. The British 14th Army advancing victoriously across Burma was shocked to see the state of the retreating Japanese. They were starving. They had nothing. They were eating grass. Um, they were in a dreadful state. How on earth they had continued fighting under those conditions, I cannot think. Later on in the retreat, they were sort of blowing themselves up with grenades, and, you know, sitting starving by the side of the road. The British were not the big killers in Burma. That grim honor went to starvation, sickness, and suicide. Some Japanese blew their brains out with their rifles, pulling the trigger with their toes. Japanese forces were also on the run in New Guinea and the Philippines. We carried the wounded on our backs. When a soldier died, his body suddenly became very heavy. People weren't so heavy when they were alive. They fled into the mountains with only what they could carry, leaving marks on trees for stragglers. Hunger pushed them to the limits. I have watched people kill live humans and eat them.
When I saw someone eat another human being, I thought it looked delicious. That's the honest truth. I'm sure you would never look at the organs of a cat or dog that had died in an accident and think that looks delicious. Well, I did. This is what human beings come to in the end, because we are just wild animals. Manila, February 1945. Encircled by the Americans, the Japanese garrison of 21,000 fought to the death, taking terrible revenge on the Filipinos for siding with America. It was like a scene from hell. We were running like rats. I saw my classmates dragged through the streets to be raped by the Japanese in Bayview Hotel. I saw my neighbors cut down by sniper bullets. The, the killing was, was terrible. The Japanese burst into the chapel of La Salle University. Hiding in the cellar were Jose and Juanita Carlos and their children. They took Jose away and killed him, then went back for the rest. Sixteen-year-old Dionysia was bayoneted twice. When she came to, she looked for her family. When I was going up the steps, I was so shocked when I saw my mother hanging on the banister. I put my mother down and uh, I kissed her. My sister, Celia, was 11. She was also bayoneted, and she died near my mother, was on the steps. When we came up here, I saw my other sister. Asela was 19. She was shot, so she must have uh, bled to death. And as we came in, I saw my brother, who was six years old, um, here near the altar rail. They also killed him. They bayoneted him. A hundred thousand Filipino men, women, and children were killed in the battle for Manila. Many by American artillery which reduced the city to rubble. In April 1945, the Americans set foot on Japanese soil for the first time, on the island of Okinawa, just 400 miles from the mainland. Japanese resistance was getting more skilled, more stubborn. As American losses mounted, raw troops were pushed into the front line, dying so fast often no one around them ever found out their names. Amid great tenacity and bravery, cracks appeared in US morale. So the lieutenant, he, he rounds up some stragglers and brings them up there. And I posted them on the line. And when I came, I checked the holes every hour. And when I came back, they were gone. The morale was real bad. I would hate to have ever been involved in the landing on the mainland of Japan. I, I doubt if we could have pulled it off. Uh, I'm speaking from experience. Uh, we didn't have the personnel. Okinawa taught severe lessons. With 12,000 American dead having to be identified and bagged up, US planners now believed an invasion of Japan might cost nearly a quarter of a million dead and wounded. 
The Japanese had sacrificed 200,000 soldiers and civilians defending a small island. What price Japan herself? People were happy to die for the peace of Japan. For Japan, people would sacrifice themselves. I don't think we would have given up. We'd have fought to the end. I was absolutely determined to devote myself to the war, no matter what happens. An atomic bomb is lifted into a B-29. Tokyo had ignored America's ultimatum calling for unconditional surrender. So President Truman ordered the first ever nuclear strike to bring Japan to her knees, save American lives and deter the Soviet Union. There was a choice of targets. The deciding factor was the weather. The target city had to be clearly visible. When I woke up, I could see blue sky through the window, without a hint of cloud. Lovely weather. I remember the radio operator said, clear and unlimited. And I said, that's fine, we're going to go to Hiroshima. And away we went. Conventional bombing raids had been forbidden over the city to preserve it as a clean test site. They wanted a target that was basically virgin. When the bomb left the airplane, it had 40 seconds time of fall until it exploded. As Paul Tibbetts banked the plane to avoid the blast, Suzuko Numata, six miles below, had just mopped her off his floor, a thousand yards from the point of detonation. I took the bucket in my left hand and hurried downstairs to the hallway outside the washroom. It must have taken less than a minute to get there. I suddenly saw a beautiful color. It was like a mixture of red, yellow, blue, green and orange, a magnificent color. I didn't hear any sound. The inside of the building was destroyed and I was buried under it. My left foot was cut off at the ankle. When I was a child and they used to pave the streets with, with the tar, always over the barrel there was a layer of steam and that's where I saw Hiroshima. You had this level of steam on top of it with the black ball in mass under it. I looked around and saw many dead bodies. Also, I could see something red, something moving. There were actually flames and people trying to escape. I heard voices saying, help me, give me some water. Mum. My only feeling was one of relief. I had not made a mistake. It went like it was supposed to go. My leg had to be amputated from the thigh down with a saw, without an anesthetic. I screamed out loud, and with that scream, I received new life. I'm sorry for the people that had to have it happen to them. But I didn't cause that. They caused it. Their side did that. No, I can't carry any guilt. I hated to see it happen, you, you know. I've heard stories told people were melted and babies and everything else. I'm sure they were, but at least they didn't suffer. Now, the ones that got rid too much radiation did suffer. That was a different deal. People who looked unscathed then sickened from the radiation. And there were the burns. I can never forget the sight of those people. They were burnt so badly that they didn't look human. Half of their ears were gone and their eyes were crushed. They didn't look like human beings. By the end of the year, deaths reached 140,000. I don't apologize to anybody. I don't feel a bit bad. I feel good. So, 
uh, I don't know. There's many different ways to look at it, but I've never lost a night's sleep and I never will. The Japanese didn't respond. Three days later, a second nuclear bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, killing 35,000. American prisoners in a camp nearby were baffled. We saw this cloud start to rise, and it was the darndest thing. And we had no idea what it was, none whatsoever. My doctor friend, Dr. Hewlett, Tom Hewlett, he looked at that and he said, Les, this war is going to be over in a week. That's exactly what he said to me. The Second World War formally ended on the 2nd of September 1945, four months after the defeat of Germany. The Emperor of Japan had decided his people would have to endure the unendurable. At five minutes to nine in the morning, his delegates arrived to sign the surrender. Gunner's mate Sai Topol had a bird's eye view. It was one of those occasions in life that you'll never forget, never forget. My heart was beating and my adrenaline was flowing and I knew that I was in on something big. You could hear a pin drop. Accompanying the foreign minister was his secretary, Toshikazu Kasi. It is something I don't really want to have to remember. No. But in my position, I couldn't help but be involved. I didn't want to go to the battleship Missouri, but I had to. You see the shots of Mr. Shigemitsu with me standing beside him? Well, that wasn't planned. He wanted to know what time it was, so I checked my watch. He checked his. It was 9.02, I think. So he wrote 9.02. He asked me if he should sign it in English or Japanese. I said, Japanese, of course. He said, oh, good. He tested out the pen and slowly signed. There was no alternative. We had lost. Let us pray that peace be now restored to the world and that God will preserve it always. These proceedings are closed. This was the end of a world war, bigger than ever before, and it meant going home, which was to me wonderful. That's the moment I can never forget. Never, ever, you know. That voice, you're right, mate, to be amongst your own. You know, it's, it's a terrific feeling. And that was freedom. I am a Mapu, wayfaring stranger, a wandering through. This world of woe, and there's no sickness Only 24 of us surfaced, you see. And look on her face when she said, but where are the rest of you? And none of us could say anything. And then I don't know whose voice it was, it was from the back, said, they're all dead. I'm going. wonderful feeling to know that you were going home. 
wonderful feeling to know that uh, you had a lot of mates that were going home with you. And then, of course, the feeling of getting home, that, 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 that's something out of this world. <laughs> there are no other, no other pleasures in life that match coming home to loved ones. A lot didn't have that pleasure, but we made up for it. And I called home. And my dad answered the phone. And I said, Dad, this is Les. And he started to cry and sob and cry and sob. And then he said, let me put mom on. And he put my mother on the phone. And my mother said, well, it's about time. But golden fields lie out before me. I got down the ground and kissed it and I was in Liverpool. <laughs> Turn the ground and kissed it. My mother coming out of the kitchen, you know, weeping and her arms out, and it just it was just wonderful. It was just a wonderful, touching moment to come home. My brothers and sisters came to meet me at Kyoto Station. They were very happy to see me, and we all broke down in tears. But I ended up going down to the Hotel Sherman, and I went into the bar there, and I it was a week later when I finally surfaced. I was out in Cicero somewhere and I was broke and I decided it was time to go home. And after four years, I went home. I was frightened of coming home. But I didn't realize it until that moment when my brother got in that car looking for me. And I turned my face away, looked in a different direction. I could not bring myself to say, here I am. And I had the greatest urge as they turn this train around and take me back to prison camp. The soldiers, changed by what they had been through, hoped the world had changed to meet them. A black soldier on his way home, a guy by the name of Isaac Woodward, that when he got to Alabama and they told him he had to uh, uh, go to the back of the bus, he said, Mr. I just got off the front lines, I'm not going to the back. And so the police came and beat him half to death and gouged his eyes out. Nigger, if you can't see that white only sign, we're going to fix you, you don't see anything. Eugene Sledge wanted to go to college and was asked what training he'd had to make him eligible for academic credit. I said, well, I qualified with the M1 rifle, the 45 caliber pistol, the Model 20 machine, a uh, light machine gun, the flamethrower, the bayonet. She said, "What? What is? It? What are you? What are you doing all that for?" I'm talking about academic credit. Why did you do? Did you? Did they teach you anything? I, and I just said in this booming voice because I completely lost my head. I said, "Lady," and, and you could hear a pin drop. I said, "Lady." There was a killing war going on, and I was one of the ones who had to do some of the killing. She was so embarrassed and apologized, and then I said, well, that's all right, I know you don't understand. Some have tried to bridge the gap. Suzuko Numata talks to people of other countries about Hiroshima, but insists on hearing first what the Japanese did to them. That's your Tony. The more of their stories I learn, the harder it is to look them in the eye. So I listen to them with my face down, and I weep. 
Then they asked me, what happened to your leg? I tell them that I lost my leg from the atomic bomb. Wherever I go, in China or the Philippines, people tell me that we are both, we are all, victims of the war. The survivors of the Pacific War are growing old. Some forgive, some do not. None forget. But I still take nightmares when he comes back. I wish to hell it would go away. But, uh... I see all those faces gradually slipping away. And the doctors just stood helpless, couldn't help them. There are still signs of the war in the Pacific. On islands like Peleliu. On the beach where George Pito landed. On the airfield which Eugene Sledge and Snafu crossed, praying and cursing. In the caves where A. Yamaguchi and Kiyokazu Tsushida hid and fought. There are sake bottles drained to boost courage before the final charge. There are the dead and the living. Eiko Takarada is on a pilgrimage to the last Japanese command post where her father was killed, a young army doctor. She was three years old when he hugged her goodbye. I'm not going to be able to do that. 